let's wait a couple of seconds for people to get in the virtual room numbers are increasing so let's give everyone the chance to be able to join us and as i see numbers going up i think we can give it a start and let me first of all obviously welcome you to this online policy briefing on the Swedish priorities for the rotating council presidency. Um, we have extremely high numbers of registrations. More than 400 people have registered for today's event, which shows the big interest in the forthcoming presidency. And I'm very happy that we have with us uh, the permanent representative of Sweden to the EU, uh, Lars Danielsson. Good morning to you. Um, I know how, good morning. I know how dense uh, your timetable is. So very much appreciated that you find the time to be with us this morning. Uh, in a bit more than five uh, weeks, I was just told 38 days, not that anyone is counting. Uh, Sweden will assume the council presidency for the third time since joining the European Union in 1995. So the country has already experience in running a presidency, but this time uh, the presidency comes definitely at a particular moment. It is another crisis pre presidency. We're living in times of war. We're living in times of economic turmoil. A lot of discussions on the cost of living crisis, inflation, also the economic perspectives for the upcoming year or years. Um, and obviously the 24th of February of uh, this year was a watershed moment, a Zeitmende, as the German chancellor has called it. Um, and it's not only a new chapter of what we at the EPC call a perma crisis, it is that the fact that we're living in a new era uh, with multiple geopolitical, geoeconomic consequences deriving from the watershed which we have experienced. Um, when entering into office in October, uh, the new Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen highlighted five key issues that, according to him, will drive the presidency. And he mentioned security of EU citizens, second, joint support for Ukraine, third, energy security, fourth, climate transact transition, and fifth, need to strengthen the EU's competitiveness. Um, in all these areas, and the EU 27 definitely do not find themselves in easy waters. And on many files, member states are not always in agreement on how to progress. In general, my reading is that we are witnessing also increasing cracks among the EU 27, although, and I'm underlining that, member states and EU institutions are trying their best to not only display, but also uphold unity in these difficult times. But often we see that it's not easy to pair unity and the level of ambition you need at these difficult times. There is at times a, what I call a rhetoric actions gap between Sunday speeches about the watershed and Zeitenwende and the reality on the ground in terms of what is needed in a new era we live in. And I think in these difficult times, um, you definitely need an honest, but also an ambitious broker in the council to push things forward. Um, so in some, I would say the Swedish presidency does not only come at a particular moment, but also at a bit of decisive and key moment. So I'm very happy that we have Ambassador Nielsen with us today. He will present uh, the Swedish um, presidency priorities. There's no need uh, to introduce, introduce the ambassador in this town. He's permanent representative since 2016. Uh, before that, he was ambassador in Germany, which obviously is also another key post. Um, and before that, ambassador in Korea, consul general in of Sweden in Hong Kong and Macau. So he knows the EU very well, but he also knows the world well, especially Asia. Um, in terms of orchestration, we've agreed that the ambassador will um, introduce the parties uh, for around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, subsequently, I might pose a first question to get uh, to break the ice before I open the floor for a general uh, question and answer session. So we will have enough time uh, for your questions related to the priorities of the upcoming presidency. Uh, we will finish on time at 12. Um, just a first technical reminder so that while you will be listening um, to the introduction of the ambassador, you have the opportunity to raise your questions in a written form via the Q&A box. Um, I will then look at which questions come up, try maybe to group them um, so that we will be able to cover as many questions as possible. With these words of introduction, again, Ambassador, thank you very much for being with us um, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janis, and thank you for this opportunity to give you a little bit of a preview of what the uh, priorities of our presidency will be. They will not be officially presented until December 14th by the prime minister in our parliament. But of course, we have a rather clear idea already of what will be 
in store for us and what we have in store for the rest of our partners in the European Union. Uh, I, this is my third presidency. The first one in 2001, I had the privilege to serve as State Secretary for European Affairs in, in Stockholm and also Sherpa and was, so to say, coordinating this from, from uh, the capital point of view. And it's interesting to compare the differences. At that time, we had rather detailed uh, um, priorities which we try to implement at that time of course the prime minister led the european council would travel to all the all the capitals of, of the union twice i think this time i think the key to a good presidency is to try to understand what are the times that we live in how does the global and european situation look like right now and how can we apply that in the best possible way to our work in the European Union. So it's a rather different, different kind of precedences we have these days, not so much because of the Lisbon Treaty, but because of, as you rightly said in your introduction, the times that we live in have changed quite substantially. Uh, I'm very happy to note that the, both the previous government and of course more relevantly the present government in my country has said our presidency should be Brussels based, which means that you know, we will focus on what you rightly say said, uh, be trying to be honest brokers, try to deal with the issues that come up here and do that in the best possible way in the interest of, of, uh, of all member states. Uh, I think there will, the question, the, the challenge for us will be, of course, to be not completely submerged by crisis management. We know that crisis management will be an important part of it, but we also need to have a, a, a big role in the legislative cycle. We're moving towards the end of the term of both the Commission and the Parliament. Uh, when I look at the workload that myself and my Deputy Ambassador, the Corp. One Ambassador, will look at, we'll probably have around 150 trilogues during our presidency. So, so it's a question of doing what President Gerald Ford could not do. He could not walk and chew gum at the same time. We will try to do crisis management and legislative work at the same time. So that's a big, big challenge. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine will influence a lot what we do and how the war develops it will be, ex and, and it, I, I don't think one can underestimate the geopolitical importance of what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, for my own country, if you'd asked me one year ago, will Sweden apply for membership in NATO? I would say not a chance. Well, now we're there. So this just is one illustration of what Ukraine, the war against Ukraine means for the European work. What will we do? Well, of course, we will have a continuous support on the military side. There we know that the European role is, more, is, is a little bit different. It's more done bilaterally, and we have the various NATO, NATO vehicles that will do that. But of course, I think we have one important role for us, and that is, of course, to try to see that the mechanisms we have to help Ukraine militarily, for example, the European Peace Facility, will need to be developed in, in an appropriate way. We will need, of course, to get the, uh, the macrofinancial assistance in place. That's right now being discussed, as you know. Uh, I hope that, that the sort of decision on what, what, what will be applicable for 2023 can be agreed upon. But if not, we're definitely ready to work hard to ensure that we get a unity on the MFA because we need to continue to support Ukraine also financially. I hope that we will get also into a more operative phase when it comes to reconstruction. Uh, and we have a number of ideas which we're now discussing with the institutions on how we can get a structure for the reconstruction, which both will allow for a, a broad European participation but also a participation from many of our like-minded partners like the US, Canada, UK, Japan, what have you. So this will be, I think, a big task for us together with the institutions to, get, to try to get the, the structure right. We may have a winter of increased migratory movements from Ukraine. I mean, we see now that the terror bombings that the Russians are doing, uh, even though we have, we have an fantastically resilient Ukrainian people, it, you know, we may have a situation where the migratory, migrat migrat migratory flows will be rather big again. They are already substantial and some member states are doing an amazing job in receiving, but we may have to do not only to, to continue with the temporary protective arrangements that we have already, but we may need to do more, but that depends very much on the situation. We also need, and that may be the most delicate issue, 
we need to get uh, a un unified position on how we look at Ukraine's European perspective. The leaders have agreed that Ukraine has a European perspective. They are a candidate country. But of course, now the wishes, not least from Ukraine itself, is to try to move even closer, to have a process which lays down some sort of roadmap, getting gradually closer, depending, of course, on the reforms that are possible to make in Ukraine, uh, given the, the very difficult situation that the country finds itself in. When I talk about Ukraine, I should say Moldova at the same time, because they're, they are basically, in that sense, in the same situation. I don't mince words. This will be a rather delicate process. There are, there are no difference of opinion inside the Union that uh, Ukraine and Moldova have a very clear European perspective. But the speed in which that can be realized, there you have somewhat different opinions. And it's our job to try to bridge those possible differences. But of course, in, when it comes to that process, it all boils down to basically what is Ukraine itself able to do, given the very different circumstances that they live in. So Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine will be a very much on the forefront of our, prior, of our presidency. The other one is, of course, to deal with the looming economic recession. We have uh, lived through a couple of months where energy prices have soared substantially in all European countries. Uh, we have, with that, of course, we have an inflation which is, 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 is going up and we have the very clear possibility that we need to face a recession during, during not only our presidency, but maybe for still some time. Now, how do we deal with this? Well, of course, energy prices, which are not the only reason for the inflation, but they are at the core. While we speak, our energy ministers are meeting to discuss long-term issues. I hope that the short-term issues on, related to the energy situation can completely be solved before our presidency. But I assume that a big task for us will be to continue the discussion on how can we have a long-term European energy market that is less dependent on fossil fuels, but which has a price structure which makes it possible for the normal European citizens to, to actually pay their energy bills, which is today, as we all know, a big issue. This is a very difficult task, not least because the fact that we have such a different energy mix in the various member states. My own country has less than 1% of natural gas in our energy mix. There are other countries which have 70, 80%. So it's quite obvious, I think. It's not easy to find. There is no one size fits all solution to this. But I think it will be a very important discussion during our presidency to see how much can we have common European answers to the energy challenges. There is a limit to it, to how much we can do, but we can do, certainly, in my mind, do more than we do right now. Here, we're very much dependent on some solid proposals from the commission so that we have something to, be, to, to base this discussion on. I'm sure we'll get that. So that's one area, one issue related to the economic side. The other one is, of course, the economic governance review that needs to be taken. Commission presented proposals not too long ago on the economic governance. Uh, we know that the, the old Stability and Growth Pact is partly outdated. It does not meet all the challenges. We also know that there is a difference of opinion. We've seen that among finance ministers for a long time. Is there a golden middle way that would make it possible for us to find some sort of common ground during our presidency for a new system of economic uh, uh, governance? I hope so, but I realize it's a big challenge. It's even a bigger challenge for a country who happens to be, at least for the time being, outside the euro area, but we can do that. Swedes can do anything they want, almost. Uh, another challenge in the economic area is related to trade. And here we have two aspects. One is, one is the more positive side, where we see a clear tendency, which we hope can be, so to say, strengthened during our presidency, that the rallying behind the importance of more free trade agreements is basically there. We hope that we can, during our presidency, conclude some. We have New Zealand, we have Australia, we have Chile, we have Mexico, we have Mercosur. We will not be able to conclude everything during our presidency, but we, I think we will move forward. And there is definitely, in my mind, a new impetus uh, when it comes to these issues. On the other hand, 
we need us to think also, maybe we can start that discussion during our presidency. We need to come back to the issue of how can we make sure that the European Union maintains its credibility as partner in free trade agreements? Because, I mean, concrete example, Canada. CETA was agreed, what is it now, four or five years ago? We still have half of member states who have not ratified it. That's a shame if you ask me. I mean, we need to avoid that kind of situation. How do we do that? That I, I, There are some answers already, but we need to deepen that discussion. That's something we want to do. The other aspect, which is more imminent and may come up even before our presidency, is, of course, the American plan to introduce this Inflation uh, Reduction Act, which, of course, is uh, protectionism on the American side. There is no other word to it. But we need to meet that. And we, of course, what, what we hope to do is, of course, to use the, the much improved climate in the transatlantic relations that we have right now to try to convince our American friends, look, look, no, this is not a good idea to do this right now. Unfortunately, it doesn't look very good. So I presume that one discussion that we will need to have in the European structures is, OK, now we have the Inflation Reduction Act. What does that mean for European industry? What do we do? Do we have to answer with similar measures? Nobody wants a trade war, and I don't think we'll have a trade war, but can the European governments and the European institutions just sit still and wait for things to get better eventually? Probably not. So this is a real challenge, and I hope, I mean, I mean we want to do everything we can to continue the much improved transatlantic relations that we see now, not least because of the, the very strong uh, American, Canadian, and British support for what's to, to help Ukraine in its, its uh, difficult situation. But the Inflation Reduction Act is a big question mark, I would say, a big black cloud, which will hang over also our presidency. I have no illusions that a country like Sweden can fix everything. But, but this one, we will certainly try to do as much as we can to provide a European answer to that. <clears throat> we will continue also in the area of, of, uh, of uh, dealing with economic issues to conclude the Fit for 55 process, which is not only something which will, not in the first place, something which will limit our economic activities, but on the contrary. I mean, Fit for 55 contains a number of golden opportunities for European industry, for European technology to move away from our old dependence on fossil fuels towards more cleaner technology and and we'd like to, to to say stress that as much as we can also and try to help that process to be continued this all all can be summarized in one sentence we need to improve europe's competitiveness and we hope that we can make this that the, we can maybe present a strategy for strengthened european competitiveness during our presidency which can then be uh, followed in not only the months to come, but also in the years to come. There are, of course, a number of other uh, individual dossiers, individual matters that we need to deal with. I cannot go into all of them, but, but uh, I think that, for example, we need to continue the work with the migration issue. We know that migration is an issue where you can lose or win elections in all member states. I mean, it's, it's politically very sensitive. We have now a roadmap, which the three institutions here have agreed to on how we can conclude that work. We will do our part to make sure that there is a clear possibility, maybe during the Spanish or Belgian presidency, to conclude the migration pact, not only inside the council, but also with the parliament, because we know that this is a challenge that will not go away. This will include both working with the internal issues in the union, but also not least with the external issues. So that's one very, very important issue. We need, unfortunately, to continue the work to uphold rule of law inside the union. I will not go into what the problems that we have inside the union right now. You all, I'm sure, know them very well. We will continue the work uh, in, in accordance with Article 7 of the treaty in the Council. But of course, we hope also that <clears throat> the issues which now mainly relate to the economic sides. I mean, we have the, the issue of the recovery fund for certain countries. We have the conditionality mechanism, which is applied to certain, certain member states. We need to make sure that the, what we have agreed on as, as parameters for paying out this, these huge sums that we're talking about, that they will be followed and monitored so that we can make sure 
that the, the, these sums are being used in the way that uh, the European Union has said that intends them to be used. But this, no doubt, it can be a very difficult uh, area. We will have some clarity, I hope, during the month of December on how, how much of an issue this will be for us. I mean, rule of law is always an issue, but how acute this will be, I think, will be clearer uh, quite soon. On the enlargement of the Union, we'll have a Western Balkan summit on the 6th of December. Uh, things are not going all that well on the Western Balkans, to be honest. Um, and uh, when we look at what can be achieved during our presidency, it may not be that much, to be honest. We'll try to move the processes forward for all the candidate countries, but it may be difficult to achieve very tangible results. And because the tangible results are to a large extent, uh, depending on what's happening in the various countries in the Western Balkans. So it may be a rather tricky issue, but we will definitely try to do what we can. One question, and this is my final point in the introduction, which I get, of course, very often is, okay, what will you do with a possible treaty change? We have the request of the European Parliament, which has been, which will be repeated, I think, again, more in detail during the spring, of calling a convention to discuss a treaty change. I would say that our assessment is, and my assessment is, that the appetite in the Council and is for a treaty discussion right now is, to put it mildly, limited. I think what uh, the, uh, the general opinion right now in the Council is that we have some immediate crises that we need to deal with first. Uh, and once we've come away in, in the crisis management, maybe we can bring up these issues of what the Union should look like in the future. I also sense very clearly that, at least in the Council, yes, we probably need to adapt the treaty at some point. But maybe what we need to start with is to prepare uh, a discussion of what does it mean if we become EU 35 in 10 years' time? What does that mean for our policies? What does it mean for the budget? What does it mean for the common agricultural policy? What does it mean for the regional policy? The treaty in itself can probably handle a bigger union. There are many of us, including my own country, would have nothing against more qualified majority voting, but that may not be the first issue that we need to deal with. We may need to deal with the policy issues. And maybe, and that's more maybe a personal wish of mine, but maybe also will be a government wish, that at some point we need to, we need to start that discussion in earnest, which in my mind is maybe more important than to have a discussion about transnational list and Spitzenkandidat. So, so we, I look forward to, to take the issue of the future of the union further, but it may be rather tricky to have an agreement between the institutions exactly on what, how that discussion should look like in the short term. There's much more to say, but uh, I will stop there and leave the room open for questions, comments, and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Lars. Um, also for giving us a, um, a rich overview of the of the of the menu, uh, with starting with Ukraine, 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 Ukraine to quote you, but also looking into um, the energy market issues, economic governance, uh, Fit for Fifty Five, migration, rule of law, enlargement, treaty change debate, and so on. So you covered already a lot of issues. Um, we see that there are a lot of questions, or I see that a lot of questions are coming in. So we'll come to them uh, in, in a second. But let me start um, with a question on my behalf. Because you said in the beginning, and I fully subscribe to that, that um, the difference, uh, you made a comparison between the 2001 and, uh, presidency and the upcoming one. And you were saying we need to understand the times we live in. And I fully subscribe to that. Um, my question is, um, you were referring a lot to obviously uh, the challenges which have now come up uh, because of the uh, the attack on the 24th of February and the watershed we're experiencing on the internal front when it comes to Ukraine, but also in terms of how we react to it. Um, but how would you see um, also giving your um, vast knowledge about, as I said in, when I introduced you, about the world. Um, what, how do you think about the geopolitical consequences um, and how they affect us? And thus also, what does that mean from the perspective of the upcoming Swedish presidency? If you could share your thoughts on that. And I will be now looking at questions coming in and trying to group some of them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But let's maybe if you start with that, that would be great. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's a small one. That's worthy of a special seminar only. Uh, I should, I of course, have talked. I, th I think what a very important part of the discussion inside the European Union, not only during our presidency, but also further down the line, is that we need to be a bit bolder when it comes to the Union's geopolitical role. Because what has happened now, partly understandable during the pandemic and afterwards, is that the rest of the world have looked upon us as being too introvert. I mean, we see this, for example, in our rather failed attempts to get support for our policies when it comes to Ukraine. We have seen, for example, of, on the votes in the General Assembly of the UN, that a number of countries around the world think that, you know, they don't share the views we have on the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we ha and that's partly, well, you, there are a lot of reasons for that. But one is that we've been very bad over the past couple of years to try to explain our narrative and to try to show that we are also open and interested in, in what others think. Now, I think we will, we will do more of that. And that can partly be done by the rotating presidency. It can more importantly be done by the leading representatives of the institutions. Uh, you know, the president of the European Council announced today that he will go to China next week. That's very good. I think it's excellent. He should travel more, in my mind. The, the president of the commission should travel more because we have a tremendous role in trying to show to the rest of the world that we're not only open for business, but we're more open for political cooperation because we have a what what can of some by some is being is called a systemic rivalry mainly between Europe on one side and maybe China and other countries. And we need to we need to while talking to the Chinese, we also need to make sure that, you know, we, we believe in what we do. We're ready to cooperate with everyone who also believes in this open free society and this open economy that has made us, uh, relatively speaking, rich. So, so th there, this is a big task, which is even big, it's too big for a rotating presidency. I'm talking a lot with my Spanish and Belgian colleague about this because I think, you know, this is a long term work where we need much better and we need to encourage the institutional leadership to do more on the geopolitical side because we are losing. We have lost ground during the past years and that is to a large extent our own fault. Yeah, and I think we also have some differences among the EU27 when it comes to how to deal with certain you know, particular geopolitical actors and what dress lessons to draw from the 24th of February. Um, so I fully subscribe to what you're saying. We need to also listen and be much more in, in touch with the, our partners and discuss issues also internally. I'll go now to uh, the questions um, which I see in front of me, which we have been submitted in a written form. We have around half an hour. And so if you allow me, I will take uh, two, three at a time so that we can cover as much ground as possible. And I'm trying to scan and group them also a bit. Um, so we have a question coming from um, Adrian Blasquez, who is asking about initiatives of the presidency with respect to the solar industry um, and in general for this, the, the, regarding the skills for the twin, twin transition. So not only uh, with respect to, uh, to climate change, but also the technological um, transition, which we're having in front of the digital transition we're having in front of us. So he asks about that. Another question relates to, um, to the IDIRPA regulation. Uh, laying out the framework for pooling EU defense procurement. Um, he, this comes from Tom Parker, who says it was designed to support European defense industry. Which position will the uh, Swedish presidency take when it comes to defense procurement? Maybe let's start with these two and then we continue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take the last one first. I mean, okay. I think there is, there is complete agreement and we will try to work on that to, that we need a stronger European defense industry. Where we've had some differences of opinion is, and how do you define the European defense industry? I mean, take my own country. We are a large, we have a relatively speaking large defense industry. It happens to be owned partly by non-European entities. It's very Swedish and thus European, and, and, uh, but it's, it's to a large extent owned by British and American interests. Uh, we have had a big fight internally on, you know, how do you define what is European? We think that the situation we find ourselves in is such that we cannot be picky on this issue. We need to be able to mobilize as much defense industrial capacity as we can. And I think that the, the, the negotiations inside the, uh, the Council on the Enderpa showed that there, this is an opinion now which most member states share. And therefore, we got a, an agreement on that issue last week. What we will try to do during our presidency on that issue is to try to move 
even further towards strengthening European defense capacity, but we should not be ideological about ownership. We should ensure that we increase defense industry capacity because, because there is a great need for it. If it's owned by Sweden, Norway, UK, France, or US, that's not the most important issue. The most important issue is that we achieve results through increasing capacity. We'll do this, of course, when we step into our presidency role, we'll try to throw away the Swedish hat as much as we can, but we'll try to promote this more inclusive approach in that area. Solar industry, well, I, I think you know, one of the reasons why we, why we talk so much about increased competitiveness is that we, you know, when we look at, for example, investment in new technology, American companies in, 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 on average invest 40% more in new technology than European companies. Uh, you know, how, how can we change this situation? Because we need, we have an advantage in the fact that we have a lot of skills in our, in our part of the world, but we need to create an environment where investments in solar and other related issues is becoming more attractive. I think the Fit for 55 is part of this, even though the, I understand that the question said it's not only a question of environmental transformation, but it, it, it's a very much, I think, a part of the competitive, competitiveness agenda that we want to introduce. That is, how can we make it more attractive, for example, for the solar industry to develop even further? Here, of course, there is a definite Chinese factor which is problematic. We know that, for example, when it comes to solar cells, this is, has been a huge issue for, for a number of years internally. Uh, and this is why it's also in this endeavor, it's important to continue the efforts to have China play on equal terms. That will not be an easy task because we're dealing with an authoritarian regime that uses the positive sides of capitalism, but then introduces elements which are, to put it mildly, not so positive. So this is a big cha challenge, but we will try to do our part in it. Very good. Um, let's take um, uh, two more questions or issues. Um, and the first one comes from Ada Gavrila. Um, and she is not the only one who's asking about Sweden's priorities in the area of health. Um, another uh, participant, Jori Bottoman, is uh, saying, is health disappearing from the EU agenda? So he wants to, they want to hear more about Swedish priorities in that field. And second, digital policy. Um, Andrea Gubitosi says that um, this was not mentioned uh, among the Sweden's uh, priorities. And given the number of digital files currently in implementation discussion, uh, what are Sweden's position in this area, uh, she asks. You can take these two. So health and uh, digital. Well, it's quite correct, of course, that there were a number of issues which I, which I didn't mention. I, you know, there's just no time enough. And when we present our presidential uh, priorities, December 14, I hope you will find a much more detailed program where both health and digital will be mentioned. Health issue is very interesting. You know, I don't think there is scope, and we will not uh, promote that during our presidency, to change how competences are divided in the health area. I mean, but of course what we see, and that's a great lesson from the pandemic, is of course that regardless of what's in the treaty, there are occasions where it's absolutely clear that member states see the merit of cooperating closer also in areas which basically are national competence. So, so, so I think we should learn from that. And it learns us two things. One is that maybe we shouldn't focus too much on treaty changes. We should focus on, on trying to, to act uh, united in areas where everyone sees a clear European interest. There may be more issues in the health area, but I don't think there are that many, to be honest. Uh, but uh, I have to, to refer you to our more detailed program uh, eventually when it's presented in less than three, it's about in three weeks time. On the digital, yes, exactly. There are a number of issues uh, which are on the table. You know, here, uh, you know, regardless of what the Swedish position is, I, I see our role here very clearly as being the honest broker and trying to get agreement on the various issues. It's it we we will do it with a digital positive attitude, if I may say so, because you know, digitalization has helped my my own country tremendously to develop to what it is today. But here, when it comes to our policies, well, let's see, we will try to be as, as, as innovative and offensive as possible, but 
don't expect us here in this area to try to let Swedish priorities influence our presidency work because we will try to be here. We'll try to take our role as honest broker as serious as possible. Very good. Um, let me take two more. The first one comes from uh, Zoe Keramitsu Tsira, uh, and it relates to agriculture. Um, and she, first of all, thanks you for your talk. And then says, um, given the current food security crisis, um, whether the Swedish presidency has any priorities when it comes to the agricultural files. Um, and let me take another one. Uh, it's an anonymous person, but I'll still take him. Um, who asks about uh, the potential developments when it comes to migration. You were referring in your introduction uh, to potential increasing uh, migra migratory pressures um, from Ukraine, uh, giving Russia's attempt to uh, terrorize people and make them leave. Um, but we also see that the numbers are increasing uh, from the southern flank uh, compared to last year's via the Mediterranean, but also via the, the, the Turkey, Greece, Balkan route. Um, so do you think that um, the increasing potential pressures, but also the increasing pressure, which we're already seeing uh, from through via other routes, that that increases the political chances that we will have an agreement in the council on a file which has um, definitely uh, led to divisions among the 27. So do you think that that is now, because of increasing pressure, is going to play in favor of it, of finding an agreement um, or, or not? Let's take these two issues. Okay, I'll start with the last one, with migration, because that's mm -hmm. also one okay. that I'm personally involved in, 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 in a lot. Agriculture is, is not my main field of activity, but I, I'll give a few comments to that as well. Uh, on migration, yes. I mean, uh, I, I think we have, in a way, a window of, of opportunity in the sense that I, I sense that there is a realization on in just about every member state that we need to have a European solution to this issue, because otherwise we cannot do it. Uh, and this go, but but on the other, so that's that's good. And the second positive thing is that, not least because of our French friends, uh, we have now a a working method which is much more structured than we've had so far. Uh, there is an agreement with the Parliament and the Commission on how we should work. This we haven't had before. Now it's a matter of negotiating the various legal instruments that we, uh, we need to have in place. That is, of course, a difficult issue because you have the constant discussion about solidarity versus responsibility, which, which is difficult uh, to because we are, we are in different geographical positions. Um, I think that we have a window of opportunity, as I said. But the problem is, of course, that in certain member states, we have the Mediterranean problem, which is very clear. You have the search and rescue efforts, which leads to ships coming in. And we know what, that that always ignites political tensions. We saw it last week between, between France and Italy. We have an extra, extra council on, on home affairs tomorrow on this particular issue. We have a very strong pressure on certain member states of secondary migration, mainly coming from the Western Balkan route, Austria, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, just to mention a few. Uh, so, so in a way, my, my take on this is that uh, this European realization, this new working method that we have, and the reality, which shows that it's even more urgent and acute than ever before to try to find a solution to this issue, will help us to find an agreement. But the problem is, of course, that we have in many member states, governments who have been elected with a mandate which is, um, hmm. how should I say it, mo more inclined just to limit migration and nothing else. Uh, and, and of course, you know, because we need to, there, there are two elements in this equation. It's solidarity and it's responsibility, and they belong together. So, but I, I choose, at least for the time being, maybe I'm naive, that we have because of the reasons I mentioned, we have a possibility now to move forward. Uh, and we're trying to do this on, on the council side in, in a teamwork, which has been very, very fruitful so far. We have achieved some already. But of course, we may also have a reality where not only Ukraine, but on the, during the, from the central Mediterranean route and from the Western Balkan route, maybe also for, uh, uh, towards Spain and Portugal, we may have pressures which be, may be very, very difficult to meet because they will be so large. So I, I'm not naive, but I, I can only assure that we will work very, very hard on this. On agriculture, I don't see us presenting new shining initiatives. I, you know, that's, that's not the role of the presidency in my mind. 
we will just try to deal with what's on the table as diligently as possible. I mean, we have uh, we we have seen because of the Ukrainian crisis. Of course, we have seen again the importance of having a European agricultural sector which can work, which can grow, uh, and that is absolutely more important than ever. But I don't expect any major initiatives in this area. Thank you. Okay, let's take two more. Um, there are a couple of uh, participants, including Oskar Magnan, who is asking about the Swedish presidency's views uh, with respect to the upcoming Critical Raw Materials Act. Um, that's something which interests uh, a couple of, uh, of, of people joining us. Um, and another one is relates to uh, giving that 2023 is being um, the European Year of Skills. Um, what kind of ambitions here uh, one can expect from the Swedish presidency also with respect to research and innovation? So year of skills and uh, critical materials. On skills, this was one of the issue which my prime minister and the president of the commission agreed that they would try to work as close as possible together with on during our presidency. Because we're and and we know that the commission, I mean, the president of the commission has very clearly said that this will be one of her priorities. She has declared 2023 as the year of skills. This goes very much hand in hand with both the competitiveness agenda that we have, but also the realization that you know our competitive strength lies in having a very well-educated, skillful workforce, and we need to do more on that. Uh, so, so I mean, what what we'll do concretely is not to come up with our own ideas, but to work together with the Commission and try to take the many ideas that they have, make them ours and try to to get our partners in the Council to agree on them. So, so skills is, of course, important. Critical raw materials. Well, I mean, there are two aspects to this. It's very clear that we need to reduce our dependency well, on China. I mean, that's what it's all about, because China is today the, the main provider of critical raw materials in many areas. But there are other countries. I, I think we, we need to work in various work strands here. One is, of course, that we should try to diversify our supply of critical raw materials. We have, we have many countries which, which uh, are interested in, in having discussions with us, both individual countries and the European Union as a whole, on supplying critical raw materials. And we have, for example, in my own country, we have uh, quite a bit of unused resources when it comes to critical raw materials. So I think what, what we need to do is to try to work to diversify our supply chains so that we're less dependent on one, but we should be very careful when doing this so that we don't raise uh, unnecessary borders, protectionist borders to others, because that is a risk. I mean, we, we need to have global supply chains in this area also in the future. We can do more in Europe. And there are countries, including my own, who I think that where there is a potential to find more of these critical raw materials, but we need to be careful so that we ensure that there is a steady supply of these critical raw materials, but that we diversify these chains so that we are not more subject to than we are already of undue pressures from certain authoritarian countries. Let me take um, two other issues. Um, a good number of uh, participants have uh, raised the issue of EU competitiveness, which you also mentioned in your introduction, obviously. Um, and I'll take one um, from Alison Hunter, who is asking about and is also linking the competitive issues to industrial policy. And she's asking whether the Swedish presidency will push for a more, quote, systematic EU response rather than ongoing piecemeal responses to the new competitiveness threats. Um, and she's also making a link to the strategic autonomy um, discussion, which you already have indirectly referred to. Um, so competitiveness, uh, industrial policy, um, question whether there will be a more systematic EU response. And then there's a rather technical uh, question related to the presidency, the running of the presidency. There's a, a participant who's asking about the preparation and staffing levels uh, in terms of the Swedish presidency. And um, I guess uh, the person refers especially to the Brussels-based dimension. So uh, let's take these two if possible. Okay, very good. Um, I think we need more of industrial policy in the European Union. Uh, that, that has to be part of the competitiveness agenda. 
but we should be very careful. I mean, I come from a country where we had some rather glaring, made some rather glaring mistakes when it comes to industrial politics in the 70s and the 80s. And we should not repeat those issues. I mean, we, the European Union consists of, of 27 member states that have a strong commitment to market economy. Uh, and we should continue that. I mean, we cannot replace that. We should not replace the market economy. Uh, we may need to be a bit more strategic in how we encourage the market economy, but uh, we should be very careful when it comes to taking measures which uh, in the long run will prevent the market economy to function the way it should function. I know this is very principled and very general, but that means, of course, that you know we've never been great friends of the, the word strategic autonomy. I, you know, I'm, I'm much more inclined to support the president of the European Commission, who likes to talk about open strategic autonomy, which I think is a, is a much much better better term. But I, I I will I will be a bit vague on this one because when my prime minister presents our priorities. I think, uh, you know, I have to save the thunder for him. To, you know, he will have some rather concrete ideas on how we can promote the competitiveness agenda. So stay tuned for 14th of December. That's called curtain raiser. Uh, and you will have more details on this. On the staffing levels, well, I can tell you one thing. I got everything I asked for as far as staff is concerned or resources are concerned for our presidency. We'll go from 120 to 200 people. Uh, this is exactly what I asked for. Uh, when I look at my staff, you know, they are, I think, the best and the brightest that we can offer in the various areas. They're they're very young, but that's probably because I'm getting old. But that's okay. But Tell I must say, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I I should say that. Uh, if we, if the, if we are a re relatively speaking successful presidency, it's partly because we have been able, I think, to, to, to gather a staff which is exactly the kind of people I would like to have uh, to lead a, a, a successful presidency. If I, I say, my, my motto is, if things go well, it's because of my collaborators. If things go wrong, it's my fault. That's the principle that we try to apply. I hope that will lead to a successful result. But we will also be very humble. Uh, you know, mm. I think it's very important for any presidency mm. to make sure that we listen to everyone. I try mm. to introduce the, a motto: "Let Malta be our Germany." Uh, I, I, I know this is just a, a, a saying, but what it means is that we should listen, try to listen to every member state as as equal, as as much as we can. And size doesn't matter in this case, uh, you know, because every member state has a special consideration that we need to be aware of and try to accommodate as much as possible. At the same time, we also need, of course, to move things forward. And, and we have qualified majority voting in some areas. We are not afraid to use that. Uh, but of course, we should. there are also some areas, not least when it comes to the geopolitical work that we do, where we actually have unanimity and we need to have unanimity and that unity can be a strength also. So, so uh, you know, there are, we will try to be uh, both firm, humble and listen to everyone at the same time. I don't know if you can do that, but we will try. I think this is the right approach. Um, let me take two other issues which have been mentioned. One relates to priorities of the Swedish presidency in the area of security, terrorism, radicalization, extremism, or counterterrorism. Um, what and w if, uh, if, yet, if, if yes, which priorities do you have there? And then there are a number of, uh, of um, participants who are asking about um, climate. Um, and I'll take uh, one from Amina Pico Demio, who was asking about the priorities after um, the COP27 agreement um, and what your priorities under the Green Deal are. But you also have others in the virtual room who are referring also to COP27, um, uh, remarking that um, the result was, uh, in my words, underwhelming in terms of the outcome of what came out of uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, what does that mean uh, with respect to, to the future? Uh, when it comes to climate change and how does this affect the European level in terms of its uh, of its action? And just to add from my side, um, I think it is also um, what we're seeing in that field, um, the fact that we're having increasing confrontation among superpowers um, and also the Ukraine war is not helping 
in, in creating the right um, uh, atmosphere glo at global level for global cooperation. So that all plays into, into, into that file. So priorities after COP27 um, and uh, counterterrorism, security, radicalization. Uh, on, on the first part, on security, terrorism, radicalization part, I mean, we have a number of legislative files that we are working with and that we'll continue to work with, and that will be the backbone of our work. I think if there is a special focus here, it will be to try to deal with, uh, with, with particular vigor uh, with the aspects of this complex which you can find on the internet, because much of this is internet related. The radicalization uh, is often uh, carried out through internet, uh, and, and there, there are legislative problems with dealing with that because all our member states have, you know, open free speech and other mottos that we deem are very important. But we see now, of course, that the, this is now being misused by, by dark forces, and we need to be more efficient and effective in dealing with this. Uh, the Commission have put, have put, has put forward a number of proposals in this area, and we're working with them now quite hard. So I think our main focus in this area will try to be to do this rather tedious but extremely important work on the various legislative acts in this area. On Climate COP27, yes, you can say that the result was underwhelming. You can also say that it could have been even worse if it had not been for the European Union. I, I think, you know, on, on the funding issue, which, you know, was one of the last stumbling blocks, uh, I think the, the fact that the European Union acted decisively during the last couple of days was, was absolutely decisive for getting a result, which at least was something. But you're absolutely right. I think we, we, we need to uh, sort of, first of all, now assess uh, the outcomes of, of COP27. But then we also need to, first of all, of course, uh, continue to clean ahead of, in front of our own door, which we're doing with Fit for 55 to a very large extent. We need to speed up our own transition uh, away from fossil fuels, which we're also doing now in various ways. And in that sense, you could say that the, the aggression against Ukraine has helped us because we are now reducing our long, short term, we're reducing our dependency on Russian fossil fuels, but I think also uh, in the long run, this shows us that we need to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels as a whole. So I think we'll do things. But I, 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 I think the, the, the way we can handle the future climate challenges will to a very large extent be depending on how we handle the energy issues. Because climate has, is to a very large extent dependent on, on energy policies. Uh, and this will be the big challenge to try to connect climate and energy work even closer in our work. We're doing that nationally in, with our new government, but I think this is also something we, we need to do in the European sense. And, and we should also, in, the, in this way, we need to bridge the gap we have with certain larger pollutants outside Europe, um, China, India, some others, which uh, maybe understandably would put the main blame on us and they have a point but that doesn't take a responsibility away from them. And I think this is also part of our increased global geopolitical work is to try to get a somewhat better climate, if I may use that word, and I mean sort of figuratively speaking, uh, to be able to, to understand that, you know, yes, the, the rich industrial countries have a special responsibility but if we are to save this planet, we everyone need to pitch in. And this, I think, you know, that's the one of the bad takeaways from from the COP27. I think is that the the uh, the tone was not very constructive at the end. We got some result, but we need to work more on re-establishing a reasonable dialogue because otherwise we will not be able to agree on the measures that are necessary, also globally. Thank you. Uh, I'm also wary of the watch of the time. So I'll take uh, two more rounds. And the first one is our two questions. One um, relates, it comes from Nicola Nielsen, who is an EU observer reporter. He's asking about uh, whether the presidency will advocate relocations under the EU solidarity mechanism. And he, I quote, why hasn't Sweden made any relocation pledges to this mechanism? Um, and the second, uh, there's a set of different questions related to enlargement. One is uh, with respect to Swedish policy on EU policy towards Turkey, um, given also the context of statements by the new government, uh, Kaspar Hophau says. And with respect to, um, to enlargement again, um, there's a question 
uh, whether the Swedish presidency will prioritize, and I quote, the merit-based enlargement or merely focus on Ukraine. Um, that's a particular question which has been raised with respect to enlargement. So enlargement and solidarity mechanism relocations. Uh, the reason why we have not committed to the uh, relocation mechanism so far is legal, and I will not go into that, but it is not possible for our government to commit itself to something which does not have a clear legal base. We may change that in the government, but that is the situation, and this is why we concentrate our effort to get this legal base, le le legal base in place, because that will also enable us to participate in solidarity mechanisms. So it's more of a technical reason why we have not been able so far, uh, neither the previous government nor this government. So this is, I mean, the legal bases need to be there, otherwise we cannot participate. Uh, that's one. On, on Turkey um, and the merit-based enlargement in Ukraine, well, Turkey, first of all, I mean, we, we, we want Turkey to be closer to the European Union, but over the past couple of years, of course, our Turkish friends have not always made it easy for us to, to, to live up to that wish. Uh, you know, we, we will see what we can do to make uh, some small but concrete steps when it comes to Turkey's uh, wish to come closer. I think it was a very important step that President Erdogan chose to, to participate in the uh, European political community that met in Prague in, in October. Uh, but, but if we are able to do more, it depends to a very large extent on Turkey, is, is my opinion. On the other issues related to enlargement, I don't think we need to choose between merit-based enlargement and Ukraine. We can do both. I mean, mm -hmm. for Ukraine, me, understand me correctly. I mean, we, we see the very precarious situation of Ukraine right now. We see the need to maybe send very strong signals to the Ukrainian people right now that yes, you have a future in the European Union. But when it comes to how quick that speed with which, how quickly they can approach this, will to a large depends will still depend on their own performance, i.e. a merit-based approach. We will not change that position. It will have to be a, a merit-based approach. I think what we have seen lately in as a follow-up of the Ukrainian war is, of course, that uh, European leaders have been more eager to send stronger European political signals to those countries who have an aspiration to to, to join us eventually, thus giving candidate status to, to uh, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, giving conditional status to Georgia. And now what's on the table, of course, is to say conditional candidate status for Bosnia. So there is a geopolitical element which may be stronger. But when it comes to the actual process, we have no intention to change the methodology that we have agreed on. That will have to be applied because, you know, the European Union is not just a club that you can just raise your hand and say, yes, I want to join. You have to live up to a number of of conditions and, and, and benchmarks, and that will not change. We will we don't want to change that, but it has to be complemented by ourselves. And I talked about that earlier, ourselves being a bit more forthcoming when it comes to preparing the ground in the present European Union of a larger on the larger union, because there we have some work to do. Yes, I'll take two more. Uh, and I say sorry to all those whose questions um, we have not been able to address, but there were too many. Um, and I'll start uh, with Louise Eric. Uh, she's from SOS Children Villages, and she wants to ask about the priorities of the Swedish presidency regarding the social agenda, and especially with respect to the fight against child poverty in the European Union with implementation of the child guarantee. And there's another question from Marina Zastava with respect to the Swedish uh, priorities regarding human rights, whether there is something you could share on um, in, in that area. So if we take these two last ones, um, and then we need to conclude. I mean, human rights is, is I mean, it, it's, all, it's always been for every Swedish government, regardless of ideological in, inclination, a cornerstone in not only in our foreign policy, but also in our European policy. So we'll try to do as much as we can to promote a, a human rights agenda in every and there are human rights ex, uh, aspects of a lot of issues as you know so so i can what i can say only is that this will co continue to be a sort of say overriding overarching goal for us to continue the work to promote human rights absolutely on the social agenda and child poverty well 
I think here is a, a matter where the new Swedish government is a bit more keen to focus on subsidiarity uh, uh, rather than joint action. The social agenda is there and will not disappear. Child poverty is a real problem in many parts of the world, but we need to be very clear when we, when we discuss and possibly take action, on what level is it most conducive to take action? Is it on the European level? Is it on the national level? And very often it's also the global level, but I think here we will be a bit more careful in deciding which kind of action on the European level has a real added value. I don't have the answer to that yet. I think you will find a bit more of that also in our presidency priorities on December 14. I made so much advertisement on that now, you will yes. all be glued to what the prime minister has, will say in the Swedish parliament on the 14th. I have to tell them to do it in English or French, I think. Maybe we can do that. Yeah, yeah everyone's okay, waiting for you. the for the curtain fall. Um, <laughs> if you give me one minute, I want to uh, go back to the question or the issue you raised at the end of your introduction when you said that a lot of people are talking to you about um, treaty change. And you, I think, were very um, uh, rightly describing the mood uh, within the council. Um, but I'm asking myself the following question. I wanted to hear what you think. Um, uh, there are good reasons, uh, both with respect to increasing the efficiency of how the EU operates, uh, but also in terms of when and whenever that will be, it tries to enlarge, uh, giving that the necessity to prepare also uh, in terms of being ready to absorb new members entering the, um, the EU. Um, but we often have a view of the convention, which I think is very much linked to what we experienced in 2002, 2003 which was uh, working towards a constitutional treaty uh, with a very large agenda. Uh, the questions of Laken were uh, immense. Um, and I think we often have the wrong appreciation of what a convention even could mean, because we could also envision a convention which is much more specific, much more targeted, looking exactly at what we need in terms of if we need, if we need certain treaty reforms, treaty changes, which could also be surgical, um, rather than open the entire box uh, when we discuss about um, a treaty change, but being be more specific and then targeted and seeing, you know, what if we achieve that, what we need to do thereafter, um, rather than look going for the all or nothing, um, opening um, uh, the, the treaties and, uh, and leaving it up to, um, to discuss everything which is uh, under the sky. Um, so what do you think of that more specific interventions and thus thinking of even a convention, which is part of the ordinary revision procedure, um, as something which would could potentially work differently than what we that many of us have in mind. Well, that, that that's of course, a, a, in my mind, a more palatable uh, variant of a convention than than the broad one. But I, I have my doubts whether it would be possible to limit it in such a way, mm -hmm. because you know we're, we're, the parliament is now working on. We know more or less what they want. Uh, to discuss. And if I look at their list, it's pretty extensive to say the least. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that it's possible to limit that. I think what we should do when it comes to the treaty is to continue our work to see what, how can we use the present treaties, notably the so-called passerelles, to improve the efficiency of our decision making. That is a work that we have started and we're doing it partly in the council. And, and, and it turns out there are quite a few things we can do uh, without changing the treaty. So, so I, I'm a I, I, I like the idea of a more limited uh, treaty revision. I think that's the only possible way. But I, my guess is that right now, if we go into a convention with a treaty change, we will not get out of it unified. Mm -hmm. And we need unanimity. So, so yeah. I think it's better in that sense to maybe approach the future of the union not in the first place from the treaty point of view, but from the policy point of view, because there you can sort of, maybe we can find some more agreement and then treaty changes may follow after that, but not, not start there. Yeah, but we even see when we discuss um, the uh, general and specific passerelle clauses use of it, how difficult it is to find an agreement among the yeah. U27, yeah. even within the current framework of the treaties. So yes. let me uh, thank you again. Thank you for being with us and for taking the time. We're now all very eager to hear what uh, and to listen <laughs> um, to what will be presented uh, mid of December. 
Um, I say thanks to all the participants, the many participants uh, of today's policy, uh, of, of today's event. Uh, and I say again, sorry to those whose questions we were not able to take up, but we will gather them and we will then uh, transmit them uh, to uh, the Swedish presidency so that they're aware of all the issues which you still have on your mind. So thank you again, Mr. Ambassador, for being with thank us. You. I wish you a good remaining day and I wish you all the best for the six months at the helm of the council um, and uh, that uh, things will work out the way you want and that the, ex the surprises will not be too big. There will be surprises, but let's hope that they will be manageable. So thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you and have a good day to all of you.